Welcome to this sermon from Silver Lake Baptist Church. Our mission is to celebrate the greatness of God with all we are for the joy, hope, and renewal of our community. We are so glad you have chosen to listen to our message. We pray you will be blessed by your time with us today. So, Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for just being with us and and being in the midst of us and being so faithful. So, Holy Spirit, I just submit myself to you this morning, and I ask that you speak through me what you want to say in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to read a scripture real quick. Well, I might not real quick, but I'm going to read it. It's in Zephaniah, and that's actually a book in the Bible, if you don't know. It's like towards the, the end of the New, Old Testament. So, it's Zephaniah three, seventeen, The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save you. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. So, I, I love this because it's talking about he's in your midst. He's a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you. How many of you know God's rejoicing over you? Man, he's got your picture in his wallet, right? And he's like, man, that's my kid. They're so cool. They're so good looking. Our response is, thank you, daddy. I know. I got a mirror too, right? So, but he like, he knows how the hairs of our head, how many we got or how many we don't got, right? And so he's a God that's just like, he's like, I want to be with you and I want to be in the midst of you and I want to be in every fiber of your life. And so much of the time, I think we, we think of God as someone who's like far off, you know, seated on this throne in heaven and like there's this big gulf between us and heaven and how are we ever going to reach God and how are we ever going to be good enough? And that's the lie that the devil puts on us so that we don't ever reach out to our Father who's like, I'm here for you. I'm right here for you, and I have a heart for you, and I love you, and I want to be with you in every aspect of your life, right? And so we can trust him. You know what? You're faithful. You're with me. You're true. You're who you say you are, and you're, you just got this love relationship with me that I can't even believe, and that's what he's about. And so I was just thinking I was like um by the way do you guys know this is the month of a lull you're like what is a lull it's a month on the Hebrew calendar that goes up to Tishri now starting in Tishri we have what's called Rosh Hashanah and the feast of trumpets and then that goes through till for like 10 days till we get to Yom Kippur which Yom Kippur is don't gasp it's called the day of judgment right and so, so it's where everyone wears white and they go before God. And this is a period of time where, where for real, they wear white and, they, and they're, they're preparing to be pure before God. But they're only pure because of a sacrifice, and that's the sacrifice of the Lamb. And so this month of a lull is the funniest thing ever because you think, well, I'm preparing for judgment. I should be really sober and I should be really like, oh, my God. I'm get-. But do you know what it is? It's about love. So it's about the Father, like, like God has a heart for Israel, right? And it's a love relationship. The Father has a, Jesus has a relationship for the church, right? And it's like about, like the Song of Sol- Solomon says, Song of Songs, Song of Solomon, whatever, it's all the same, right? Okay? So he says, I'm my beloved and he is mine and his banner over me is, is love. So he's like, man, I see you and I have a heart for you and I'm coming to you. It's the only time that the king leaves his throne and comes to the field. And as he comes to the field, we have the opportunity to go to him and to meet him there. And here he is and he's running. You ever see those those like um, movies where where the guys running? Uh, Oh, where they're like fighting. You don't think they're going to get together and then they're on this beach. Well, this is in the field, right? And so here they go, they're running to each other, and then they hit each other, and they both fall down, right? You guys don't watch the right kind of movies if they don't. You know? It's my story. I'll tell it like I want, right? But this is, God's like so cool. 
man, he walks in, he's like Brad Pitt. You know, or Robert Radford, Rad, Redfoot, Redford. Yeah, something like that. He's just so cool, man. And here comes this beautiful bride. And not the runaway bride. <laughs> Some of us are. You know what? Some of us are like the runaway bride. We're, we're like, we can't commit. We get right up there and then we're like, I'm out of here. And we go to the hot dog stand. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? And then they're like, whoa. But here comes, here comes Jesus. And he's walking through the field. And he's like, I'm my beloved's. And we come walking, I'm my beloved's. And he is my and his banner over his me. And he's like, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. And we come to him and he meets us in that field. And, and he loves on us. And he says, you know what? I love you so much. I sent my only son to die for you. And Jesus is like, I died for you, dude. What else do you want me to do? <laughs> right? What more do I have to do to show you that I love you? Right? And here he is, we're in that field. And he's like rejoicing and singing and dancing like a Disney princess with the birds. That's when the birds are like going all over. And we're having a relationship. And we're communing. And that's what this whole month is all about. Now, what, to, the, to the rabbis, they talk about this as being a month of repentance, right? But we look at repentance as, oh, I'm going to put... At, um, sackcloth and ashes and I'm going to go down here and I'm going to look like a rerun of a he, hee-haw movie <laughs> or a show, right? Whoa, it was me in agony on you. And then, then our dog howls, right? My dog don't howl because he's not a cute dog, so it's not like, oh, roar. It's like, ruff, ruff. <laughs> right? You know what I'm talking about? And so we're like, oh, my I'm so sorry, God. I'm just a rotten heathen and I've just been so bad and thumbs up. I can't come to you until I'm cleaned up enough or I did. And he said, look, what are you talking about? Do you know who you are? Do you know what I've done for you? Do you know that my work is perfect and it's perfect in its place? And so that repentance doesn't mean that you go down like that, but that repentance, actually the word repent, do you know what it means? It means repent. <laughs> I just, I like those fancy words, right? But it means to turn around and go to Him and to seek Him. But it also means re, like that's when you ever see re, it's like go back to. But pent, what is pent? Do you ever go to a hotel and they say, we have a penthouse, but it's in the basement? I want the penthouse, and you're looking at there's no windows. This is the basement. No, why? Because it's on the top. Do you guys hear what I'm talking about? It's way up here. And so it's not, it's it's where you can see, and it's at the very top, and you can't get any higher than being with Jesus. The Bible says that we are seated with him in heavenly places. Isn't that awesome? And so when we repent, we're actually returning to that place of grace where we were placed by God through Jesus and his finished work. You guys hear what I'm saying? But as a rabbi talk, it's like we, we go back to the Father and it's the only time that he ever leaves the throne and comes and meets us in the field. It's a picture of what Jesus did for us when he left the throne in heaven and he come in the form of man and he come to serve and he come to die for us. But then he rose again and now he's coming and this month, I want you to put that in your, in your heart and in your mind and say, you know something? I'm going to return to you with all my heart. I'm going to meet you, and I'm going to have a relationship with you, and I'm going to prepare as we're coming up to the Feast of the Trumpets and Rosh Hashanah. And then, uh, actually, on the second day after Rosh Hashanah, Rosh, Rosh Hashanah I try to say that, like... Peter Piper picked a... I'm from Oklahoma. We don't say stuff fast. Right? If I was from Texas, it'd even be slower. It'd be like, hello. Right? But, it, but I'm not, right? So we go up, and it, it's called the Tashlik Prayer. And so um, what we do is we take bread, and we go to live water. Now, why do we go to live water? Do you know when, when um, the Jewish people would baptize 
they had, they were called mikvah. Do you know that the Baptist church didn't come up with baptizing? <laughs> it's good we do it, right? Do you know it was a Jewish thing and it was called a mikvah. Before you could even go in the temple, you would have to go to the mikvah. And then you would go straight down and it represented that I was dying to myself and I was coming back to life, right? So anyway, it'd have to be live water. So you can never go to a mikvah that was stagnant because all the stuff would collect in there. So it's like as far as the east is from the west, so far will your sins be removed. So it goes with the water, right? And it flows it away. And it's symbolic of what God's doing for us. So, so it's live water. So you take your bread and, the, and we cast it on the water and we repent. And we say, Father, I return to you. I give you my everything, right? So it says that, um, like, listen to this. This almost plays into what I'm going to preach. Ha, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> that don't happen very often. <laughs> praise the Lord, O my soul, and my own inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the name of the Lord, O my soul, and forget, forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with compassion, with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your root, you, the, your root, your youth is renewed like an eagle. So watch this: who forgives some of your sins, a few of your sins, all your sins, who heals all your diseases. Do you know what that means in Hebrew? The word all it means all. It's not, not like the detergent, right? <laughs> right? But if you'll give him your all, the tide will change and you'll end up with a lot of cheer. <laughs> <laughs> it's the truth. Don't get downy on me. Yeah. <laughs> Back at you. Now we're gaining. We call him Mr. Clean. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is church. We're not supposed to have fun. What is, what's the matter with you guys? You really need to repent. Right? Where was I at? Okay, and you're all, right? All your diseases. So we, we take the bread and we cast it on the waters. And it, we watch it. When we watch it, we're, we're seeing all our sins, all our diseases, everything going away. And when you see that and you look at it from that perspective, it will do something in your heart. Because it gives you something physical. It's like communion, right? When we, when we take, partake of the Lord's Supper, it actually comes from, from a Passover Seder, right? And we're not drinking the first cup, right? We're drinking in a different cup. But when we're taking it, we're taking the blood. And we're drinking it. And when we look at it, it reminds us, you know what? Jesus shed his blood for me. And that's the price. And there's something powerful in that. And so when we see it, my sister got healed um, she actually got up off of her deathbed, and so it was incredible. She had had, a, had she was going actually to to college to be a missionary, and she got this disease, and she'd been sick for two years, and she had withered down to nothing. But she she's like, I'm going to finish college before I die. So she would literally go up, get on her hands and knees. They didn't have like um, what are the handicap stuff that they have nowadays. So some of her professors and stuff said, why don't you just go home and die? Why are you doing this? She says, I'm going to finish. So she would get on her elbows and crawl up the steps. And finally, kids would come help her. But she finished school. And now, because of what she did, you know what? They, they have like handicapped ra- ramps. She changed the culture because she said, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to do what God has for me. And so... My mom had got up, they'd sent her home from the hospital, and they said, you're going to die. There, there, there's no hope. We can't do anything more. And so she didn't want to go on hospice. And so my mom and dad were staying at, a, at the ministry campground in Fort Worth. And so they sent her home, and she was in the trailer. And 
it was in the morning. She's laying there, and she's like, okay, Father, I'm ready to go home. She said she heard a voice, and God said, get up. My mom and dad were out planning her funeral. She's supposed to die. There's no hope. She said she heard it again. I said, get up. No, I'm not getting up. I want to go home. I'm so tired. I can't go anymore, Father. I can't do it anymore. She said the third time she heard him, she thought he might come whop her on the head or something. (laughs) She was shrunk down to nothing, hadn't walked in nine months. And she could barely move her foot. And she got her foot and she moved it to the edge of the bed and it fell to the floor. And the moment it hit the floor, she was completely healed. My mom and dad are in there planning her funeral, and she gets up and walks out, and she says, Could you make me some eggs? I'm hungry. (laughs) Then after my mom and dad got up off the floor from being passed out, (laughs) right? Tell me that God don't heal no more. Tell me that this word doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, hey, I don't believe you. I believe God. Because what he did, and do you know something? She ended up going and speaking at that college. She ended up up being on the radio and telling everyone. And doctors got saved because they said, this is impossible. And she says, no, it's not impossible because Jesus did this for me. He paid the price for me. And this is mine. It was like a couple years later, they went. We have a lake in Oklahoma and my mom and my sisters went and they'd go cast the bread on the water. But it was the only kind of live water we had. It was kind of in a drought, so they had to like walk way out. And she walks out. She starts casting the bread on the water, and she stops. And the Lord says to her, do you know what today is? She says, no. Yeah, I guess I know. We're... What's this the anniversary of? It was the exact anniversary of the day that God healed her. And told her to get up. Isn't that incredible. I want to tell you, I don't care what the doctors said. I don't care what is going on in your life. I don't care what your bank account looks like. Do you hear what I'm talking about? God just overrules all that stuff. And he says, you know something? I'm here to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. And if you'll just trust me, this is a time of life where you can come into and I'm going to judge you and I'm going to give a judgment, but this judgment's not going to be that you're a rotten sinner, but this judgment is you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are my son and you are my daughter and come into all my fullness and into relationship with me. And come eat with me and have a relationship with me and let me be your dad. Amen. Man, we get so hung up looking at ourselves that we don't realize that God, when he looks at you, he's like, man, that's my kid. I love him. He don't care how rotten you you, you are. I mean, he does, but it's not because he don't love you. It's because he's like, I want to pick you up and I want to show you who you are. And I don't want you to walk like a pauper. I want you to stand up and walk like a king. Because you're joint heirs with Christ Jesus. As he is, so are you in this world. You are his representation in this world. Hey, that's a re- responsibility. Right? So now we're not going and doing it because... We have to to get good enough. We're saying, you know something? I, I'm a king. I'm righteous. There was something paid for me. I'm, the, I'm valuable. Do you know that you're still God's highest form of creation on this earth? Everybody's like, well, from dust you came and from dust you'll go. Listen, when you were created, it wasn't cursed dirt. It was from the Garden of Eden. Now listen, it was fruitful dirt. When he took it, it it wasn't just rotten dust. That's where your roots come from. You started out valuable. And then then he blew his spirit, the ruach, 
Yeah, they call it in Hebrew, it's the Ruha. It's, it's the Holy Spirit. And he breathed that spirit. Well, it wasn't the Holy Spirit. It's our spirit that he blew, blew into us. And now, not only do we have our living spirit, but we have the Holy Spirit Amen. living inside us. And we can trust God for that. So we go from the Taslik, and then you got like eight or nine days, and then you come into Yom Kippur. Rabbi once told me, I was like, I don't know, why is a a lull a whole month? I mean, seriously. And then you you only got like 10 days from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur. And he's like, well, that's simple. God's mercy always precedes his judgment. Mm. Now think about that. Completely and totally always precedes his judgment. That's why he sent Jesus. See, Jesus, it wasn't like Jesus was sitting up there, man, there's nothing good on this season on TV. (laughs) To that, I don't got nothing to do. So maybe I think you should come down in the form of a man and die on a cross. No. It was planned. He said, you know something, something was lost in Eden. My people, they, they didn't understand. And now they're not eating from the tree of life, but now they're eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and, and that's what the tree that brought their fall. And he says, I don't want you focusing on that tree. I don't want you focusing on religion. I don't want you focusing on do good, get good, do bad, get beat. I want you to focus on life. And who is life? Jesus is life. He's life. And life more abundantly. And so when you trust Him, and you give your heart to Him, and you give your life to Him, man, you can't help but have life coming out of you. That same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside you. Think about that. Man, that Spirit exploded an entire stone, right? It obliterated it. All those, all those soldiers around went, boom. They were knocked out. That same spirit that brought Jesus from the dead lives inside you. Now who's in trouble? Not the stuff that's attacking you. That's what God says. If God be for us, who can be against us? Right? I love this because this Psalms 103 is, is it's more of a... It's a... Um, What do you call it? I call it the benefit package. Anybody? I mean, if you go to work for someone, right? You're like, okay, I know I got this. What other benefits do I have? Most of them look at me and say, well, you're not starving. (laughs) Right? If I was hiring someone, I'd say, you get to look at this face. (laughs) Right? But for some people, they might need more. Right? So they have 401ks, right? But they never put $401,000 in there for me. I mean, what's up with that? I mean, if you're going to do it, put it like $1 account, right? I mean, come on. And then they have insurance and they have all this. You know what? You have a benefits package. Can you imagine like, like um, I don't know all the royalties names and stuff. I don't care if they get married or if they don't. But apparently my wife does and every other lady around. Right? If you don't, good for you. Right? <laughs> So all these kings and princes and these princes marry them and it's a big deal and millions of people are watching all over the world. And I'm thinking, that's an earthly royalty. What about our royalty? It's out of this world. Literally. But it brings us back down into this world. The Bible says you're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. Says uh, you're peculiar too, but we'll skip that part. <laughs> but that could be good too, right? You're set apart, and you're different, and you have a benefits package that's out of this world to match who God created you. And again, who forgives and forget not? Don't forget it when you get in trouble. Don't forget. Guess what? He forgives all my sins. 
He heals all my diseases. He redeemed my life from the pit and he crowns me with love and compassion. He satisfies my desires with good things. You know, a lot of things with believers, we say, well, I can't get good things now because I'm a Christian, so I'm just going to suffer for Jesus. <laughs> what bunk. That's what's holding the church back so much. It's not, it's not bad to have material things. It's bad when material things have you, though. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know the best servant you can have is be able to write a check to someone and go out and see wells dug in Africa. And if the church is so poor they can't help, what hope is there? Money's a servant. It doesn't have a soul. It's neither good nor bad. It's what you do with it. Right? So he just satisfies our desires. And the Bible says that he gives us the desires of our heart. I think that's two-pronged. He just don't give us everything we desire, but those things we desire, I believe he gives us. Right? So like I desired to to be a cult starting challenge. And guess what God did? He's like, he took me farther than I ever dreamed I could have when I entered the first one. I didn't even know if I could live through it. (laughs) And look what he did. I just got done judging one. And I was like, watching all these kids. And and there's a young lady, and um, she's from Idaho, and she's right on the verge of the final. She's made the final, but she's going to have to keep moving on. And then another kid that's been riding with me from t- since he was 12 was entered. And he's entered a couple, and I've been coaching him, and ended up second. And I was like, this is awesome. So you think you, you, you get a desire from God, and you step out, and you're like, well, I don't know if there will be any fruit. It's one thing for me to go out there and do it, but when I can watch all these kids come up under me and take what I do and go win too, then I'm leaving something else. That's what Jesus done for us. But I was watching this girl, and she... Hadn't run into a really hard horse, and she had a rank on and got into the very end and it bucked her off. And I looked at her, and I was like, oh, man, that was a bad deal. It was a rank horse. I know a lot of guys went and crawled on it. I went and crawled on it when I was that close to the finals. I'd have been like, yeah, you know what? We'll go next week. <laughs> she crawled back on that sucker. You know what happened? Boom, off again. So her dad and the guy who puts it on had to go get her and say, Please don't get back on. And she was mad. So I was talking to her dad afterwards, and he's like, she's really upset because she, like, wanted to finish. And I was like, you know something? It's like there's a lot of guys I know that went to the finals that wouldn't have got on that horse again. I was like, she should be proud. She goes, will you go tell her? And I was like, why do you want me to tell her? He goes, she looks up to you. You've been where she's at. I was like, okay, I'll go talk to her. So I told her. And I looked in her eyes, and she's crying. She's like, I failed. I did this. You ain't failed until you crashed at the last obstacle in the national finals. <laughs> you want to cry? Well, I'll cry with you then. Right now, I was like, do you know what makes you a champion? It's horses like that, not the ones that you can, anybody can win on. It's those horses like that and the fact that you got up and you started going and you kept going and you didn't quit. And I was like, you know something? You got some grit. I was like, if you'll fix this, 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 and this, you'll go to the finals and beat everybody. And I said, you are a champion. That's what champions do. And I watched as tears flowed down her eyes. And I looked in her eyes and I was like, "Woo, those boys are in trouble. Because I seen her. Resolve. I seen the fighting spirit of a champion. I seen that roaring of a lion wanting to come out and say, I'm here to kick you guys' tail ends all over the place. And she got a glimpse of it and she believes it. And she's dangerous. <laughs> There's only been two girls that's even made the finals. She would be the second. And I believe she'll make it. And I believe she'll go win it. And so I was just thinking of how if we'll just get that grip. Maybe you've been knocked down. Maybe you've been bucked off. Maybe you've had everything's going. 
That's what makes you a champion, not the glory. It's what's happening when all hell's breaking loose in your life. Anybody can make it when it's easy. What about when it's hard? You get a growl to you and say, you know something? I've got the lion of the tribe of Judah living in me and he's going to growl. And you'll see what he'll do. He'll wipe all that stuff away. We went, um, when I was younger, I was a youth pastor. I started out as a youth pastor, actually. Which, as serious as I am, it's hard to believe anyone would (laughs) put up with me. So I went into this church, and they had 12 youth. But they were just playing. And God said, I want you to start preaching the word. I was like, well, this is going to go over good. I was like, okay, guys, we're going to come in. We're going to have fun, but we're going to have some Bible, too. Next week, I come back, and there's one kid. I single-handedly dismantled my (laughs) youth group in one week. One kid. So I went to the pastor. You going to fire me? (laughs) Am I in trouble now? I wasn't getting paid for it anyway, so it didn't matter. (laughs) Right? But I wanted to see it grow, right? He's like, no. He's like, I think you're right. And I was like, really? He's like, yeah. So for six months, I preached to one kid and a bunch of chairs. And I was getting to the point where I was ready to give up. And I went to another church pastor down the road that I really respect and unrespected for quite a few years. And I said, hey, I'm... I, got this going on, I'm going to give up. And he said, well, I want you to think about this, but I want to tell you the story. So this man, he went to college, and it was in the 1800s during the gold rush, and he learned all the stuff he needed to find where the, the right gold was or whatever. He made a claim and started digging. He dug and he dug and he dug for about six months. And he made sure it was six months because it was about the same time I was in. He said, he got mad and tired, and he quit. He buried all of his stuff in the mine, walked away, and died a drunk, broke and poor. Moral of the story is this, if there's a moral of the story. I like saying that just because it sounds like I'm telling something cool, sophisticated. (laughs) Right? And I can hold my finger up like this. But good. He said, watch this. He's like, several years after he gave up, another company come in and reclaimed his mind. Went in, found his stuff laying there, went six inches and found the largest mine that they'd ever found in the world at that time. He looked at me and he said, don't give up. You may be six inches from gold. I was like, whoa. So I went back and I was pumped up. There was one kid at church again. So next week there was one. Then we had two. And all of a sudden something happened. I've never seen anything like it in my life. They got on fire for Jesus. And we've seen over 50 kids mm, God. give their heart to Jesus. The Assembly Church and the Baptist Church come together with their youth groups because there were so many kids getting saved. And I've never seen anything like it in my life. It had nothing to do with me. It was the kids reaching the other kids. But it had everything to do that you don't give up. You don't quit. You've got to know that God's mercy is preceding his judgment right now. It says on down here, it says, He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us with According to our iniquities, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far, I don't think that's, I think that's north and south. As far as the east is from the west, that's, from the east is from the west. I need a compass. Anybody got a compass? Right? You get what I'm talking about, right? As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgression 
from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. And I'm going to close for the first time so I don't keep you from the Seahawks game. <laughs> then they'll be lent. <laughs> this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Amen? Amen. So, Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for just being with us. I just ask that this month you just show us your love and your banner over us and how much you love us and how much you're for us. And I just thank you for that. Oh, sorry. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more about us, check out our website at www.silverlakebaptist.org.